Thank you, uh, Joel, for the, um, the introduction. Uh, thanks to everyone um, being uh, here today. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be part of this panel. Um, and you can see the title. Uh, this will be more focused on North Korea. And of course, when I signed up for this, I was hoping uh, to be able to share more news and to work with more uh, data, so to speak. Uh, but as you may have heard, um, of course, the Hanoi uh, summit essentially collapsed without uh, any meaningful uh, kind of new data points uh, and uh, insights what's going to happen next. Um, there is uh, some room for optimism, uh, though. Um, in, you could argue that Hanoi was a, a teaching moment. Uh, and we, I think, now understand that North Korea uh, will not simply hand over its complete nuclear arsenal on, on day one and then hope um, for you know, something in return uh, afterwards. Now, whether or not you believe that a complete denuclearization has to be the ultimate goal of the current process, or whether you believe um, that in a more, we'll end up with a more traditional uh, agreement that would somehow constrain or limit North Korea's nuclear arsenal, uh, verification of such an agreement will be front uh, and center. Uh, so this talk really is about the verification challenges uh, that we would face in this regard, and Scott has already alluded to some of them. Um, so what are the big verification challenges in, in North Korea? You can uh, put together your favorite uh, list, and you can have you know, 17 on this uh, chart. I ended up with uh, four big ones that I consider most important. Uh, the first two ones are really uh, relevant for almost any arms control agreement you can imagine in the North Korea context. How would we verify a freeze on fissile material production? Um, an important point, and we believe ideally such a freeze uh, should or could be um, monitored with, uh, with or verified with remote, remote monitoring uh, techniques. That's one. A second item would be uh, confirming limits on uh, nuclear weapons, on missiles and missile launchers. And ideally, if this is part of the agreement, um, even a, a kind of a monitored storage uh, of these items to ensure that they're not actually uh, deployed. So these are two big uh, items on this list. Um, in addition, if you're really going all the way and you want to kind of, you aim for the complete denuclearization, there are additional challenges. Uh, one of them would be the verified dismantlement of uh, nuclear warheads. And as Sika Hacker recently said, um, you really want to have those folks who put these things together, those should be the ones who also take them apart. You probably don't want to ship them around uh, the world. Uh, so this is one aspect. And uh, finally, and this is also something that Scott already mentioned um, with the nuclear archaeology um, uh, aspect, you know, how do you confirm that the declarations that North Korea would be making is actually complete? How do you, how do you reconstruct um, uh, the complete you know, North Korean history or the, the history of North Korean weapons program. So I will focus, uh, in the given you know, the shortage of time here, I will focus on one of them, actually the second one, how would you monitor North Korea's nuclear arsenal or confirm limits um, on, uh, on its arsenal. But before I get to this point, let me briefly explain what I think the relevant premises are uh, in this context. You know, what are the requirements for monitoring and verification technologies? Uh, in the case of North Korea and, and beyond. Um, first one is I think we really need technologies that are more or less available and ready uh, to go. Um, I mean, there may be, there's always some R&D, but it, this is maybe not the time for some blue sky you know, ideas, what we may be um, able to develop you know, 10, 15 years down the road. Ideally, you want to have technologies that are ready for deployment. Um, second, I also believe, given where we are in the process. Ideally, we want to work with technologies and, and protocols, concepts that are non-intrusive, that minimize frequency of on-site inspections and direct access uh, to items. Um, at least we want to kind of start with something uh, perhaps modest and, and build on top of that and not go all in you know, on day one, because I think this would probably be a, a non-starter. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think we have to um, recognize uh, concerns that North Korea would have in terms of uh, security. So North Korea, and again, uh, Scott alluded to this, North Korea does not want to give away GPS coordinates, so to speak, of, of all its items and, and create a target list uh, for, these, for these items. So this, these are some of the, the, uh, the constraints or the premises that I work with when we kind of approach this problem. 
So back to these challenges. So as I mentioned, what I want to talk about uh, for the next you know, 15 minutes or so is you know, how could we confirm um, limits on, um, on items, uh, accountable items, uh, and how could we monitor, let's say, these items when uh, they are in storage. Um, so we, uh, together with the team in Princeton and some colleagues uh, elsewhere, we, we've been exploring three different possibilities. And, um, and again, I will simply talk about one of them today. Uh, but let me just run through the list uh, real quick. Um, one idea that we've been um, proposing is uh, remote monitoring of declared items. And here the idea is that, uh, let's say we'd, we're thinking about warheads, North Korea would offer um, uh, batches of warheads. We would meet uh, at a kind of a meeting point where we then um, containerize these weapons, seal them, and prepare them for long-term storage. These would be special seals, probably electronic seals of some sort. Uh, and the North Koreans would then take away, you know, batch by batch these uh, warheads, which are now containerized and not mated with a delivery system, to an unknown secret location. Uh, but the trick here would be that we would still be able to remotely confirm that uh, the weapons are still sealed uh, and in storage, for example, by having challenges. And the ability that the North Koreans can respond to that challenge, let's say like an RSA um, token or key fob, that they're able to read a certain number and report it back to you, prove that the, um, the weapon and the container is still intact uh, and, and in storage. So that's an idea we, uh, together with Zia Mian, who just uh, spoke moments ago, uh, proposed as part of a science uh, paper uh, you know, a couple of months ago. So that's one option, how you could actually uh, prove or have confidence in the fact that weapons are non-deployed uh, without knowing where exactly they are. That's one. Uh, a second idea is the so-called buddy tag. And for those of you who know me, uh, uh, probably heard about the buddy tag before. And this is actually the one I want, uh, I want to talk about uh, today in a little bit more detail. So I'll skip over it right now. Um, and the third one, uh, also not an idea that is particularly new, the um, National Academy of Sciences proposed this in 2005 in, in one of its reports. Uh, is the idea of hashed uh, declarations, cryptographically hashed declarations. And again, with uh, the team uh, at Princeton and also Sebastian Philipp at, at Harvard and uh, Ed Felton, uh, who's at Princeton, we've recently kind of uh, fleshed this out a little bit more and um, made it specific to the North Korean context. Here, the basic idea is, um, or the beauty is, you don't work with any technologies at all, except for you know, cryptography. Um, North Korea would declare uh, its inventory in, in encrypted form, in hashed form. Uh, it would, you know, in a way, go a commit to a certain number, you know, whatever that number is, of treaty accountable items. And, um, and that's all we're getting uh, on day one. We don't know where they are. We don't know what they are, perhaps. And then in down the road, if we decide to inspect a certain facility, if we get to that point and say, OK, we want to see facility 17 or facility A, uh, please reveal um, the clear text for these facilities, um, we could then kind of demonstrate that um, the, the number of uh, treaty accountable items do not exceed the numbers that they originally declared. Um, a very simple way, no gadgets involved, uh, but some cryptography. And we think in the North Korea context, it would be a particularly interesting concept, you know, and obviously ready to go. So that's one, two, three. As I said, uh, I would like to kind of spend a few minutes on the buddy tag, um, which is one of our uh, uh, projects we've been actually working on for some time. And you know, it occurred to us recently that in the North Korea context, again, it would actually be quite uh, applicable and relevant. So this is not a new idea. Um, it actually uh, goes back to the 1980s. Uh, Sandia uh, started working um, on this. And then more recently, jointly with us, we resurrected the idea and, um, and kind of developed an advanced prototype, if you will. So let me just briefly explain you know, what this is about. Um, so how do you count things? So this, the idea is the, there would be a limit on a treaty countable items. It could be missiles, could be warheads, could be missile launchers. Uh, how do you count things? Well, the way you don't do it is you don't bring everything uh, to the same location, which is what uh, Bolton proposed in a way. Um, you know, if you count, you don't count cars by bringing them all to the same parking lot, which is impractical. And in the case of North Korea, it would be you know against their security interests to do so. 
So what you do is instead you issue license plates and um, essentially turning a, a ban or turning a numerical limit into a ban on untagged items. So you get for every declared item you get a license plate. Very simple and from then on you don't want to see warheads or cars without license plates. Now, so what options do you have to tag? Well, you can just use the serial number that is probably on the item to begin with. That's not very robust because you can have duplicates and, and so on. Uh, or you have a unique identifier that is really unclonable um, and unique. And uh, so once you see it, you know it's the, the real one. Uh, the disadvantage is twofold. Um, you have to actually attach it to the treaty accountable item and there are again concerns that this may just not work with missiles and warheads and so on. Uh, and you need direct access to, to this item as an inspector, which again uh, may not be applicable or relevant in this case. So at some point someone had this idea uh, and you know, I honestly don't know who it was uh, of the buddy tag where you say, well, if we can't do this, how about we separate both? We separate the treaty accountable item and its tag. So every treaty accountable item becomes a buddy, uh, uh, obtains a buddy, a friend. Uh, instead of, and then we have the ID on, on the buddy, and we don't even have to see the treaty accountable item in the beginning. We just give you one buddy tag and for each item that you've declared and you take it with you. So it's kind of perfect for the North Korea case where we assume the North Koreans won't let us see all their weapons, warheads, missiles at the same time. Uh, it turns out if you kind of go back in the origins, origins are kind of a little um, obscure, um, but this is one drawing that you know, I found in the archives. Um, it apparently was originally envisioned for uh, missile systems, mobile missile systems, and you know, I suspect this may have been related even you know, to the INF kind of sort of uh, verification you know, ideas that were kicked around. And you see it here, kind of the buddy tag placed on a, a mobile missile launcher. And you know, it has uh, you know, a temper indicating a closure. It has you know, power and so on. The most important element of it, and I want to highlight this because I don't want to forget um, saying it, is it has to be able to detect when it's being moved. It has to be very sensitive to displacements. It has to be able to recognize vibration, cultural noise, earthquakes, what have you, from a very, very stealthy displacement. That is the trick. Uh, and that's what's kind of technically, technically challenging about the body attack. So how does it work? Uh, bear with me, uh, lots of words here, but uh, just for a minute or two. How would this look like in, in an actual you know, use case, e.g. North Korea? So uh, you would have to initialize the regime um, in the sense that North Korea would receive one body attack for uh, each declared accountable item. And we could agree this are warheads, it could be missiles, it could be uh, delivery um, missile launchers, which are all relevant in a North Korea case. As I mentioned, each tag has a unique identifier uh, and is kind of in a temper indicating enclosure, so it's protecting itself. And uh, the locations of these tags, once they are deployed, would be unknown uh, to us, uh, the international community, the inspectors. That's part one. Um, between inspections, routine operations, again, very simple. A body tag must be stored near the accountable item, at least at the same site. There is no one-to-one -one association between the tag and its accountable item. Uh, only the total numbers must match, and that's all there is. If you have seven warheads, you have to have seven body tags somewhere sitting close to it. And um, if an accountable item is moved from one side, a body tag must go with it. And that's kind of these are the rules of the game, and, and we would have to agree on those. So far, relatively boring. Um, so what would then happen if we call a short notice inspection, um, again, at, at some point you do want to inspect, you know, selected sites, otherwise, uh, you know, you're not learning anything. Uh, you would say the site goes into the stand down and you can watch this with, you know, national technical means, uh, satellites, perhaps with other uh, arrangements uh, to make sure that nothing big is going in and out, trucks and so on, while your inspectors are kind of coming to the site. Um, and from then on, body tags and the items, of course, are not, um, it's, are not, cannot be moved on site or off site, which is why the body tag has to be able to detect when it's being moved. And then the inspection itself simply confirms that the number of body tags matches uh, the number of items. 
so over time, you should uh, become more confident when you, know, you do this a bunch of times that actually the, the inspected party in North Korea was honest to begin with and there are no undeclared items over time. And there's always, you know, what about the unknown unknowns? But, you know, you have to deal with this problem anyway. Um, and, you know, gain confidence through different processes. So here's just a cartoon how this would look like. Uh, you know, you walk into the, uh, the storage facility, you see the buddy tags, you look at them, are they still, um, you know, healthy and uh, haven't been uh, moved? You count one, two, three, and then you look uh, across, uh, you know, through a window, what have you, and see three 3D three countable items. Again, these are warheads, but it could be um, a missile, it could be a, 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 a missile launcher. That's uh, the idea. Um, so here I actually have some data for you. Um, so this is kind of followed onto the project that we had with Sandia. We actually recently just very uh, recently finished our you know, final prototype where we're really happy with its, its performance. It's about you know, a four inch diameter uh, contraption. Um, and let me just start from the, the bottom. It has a you know, heavy steel plate just uh, to minimize vibrations. We use uh, five uh, accelerometers uh, just uh, to kind of have some redundancy and to reduce noise, you know, square root of n uh, sort of thing. Um, but these are kind of very low cost devices, uh, which is something that Sandia couldn't do in the 80s where you had uh, to use export controlled, you know, very high sensitive, uh, very, uh, very sensitive missile guidance, uh, you know, sort of systems. Uh, here, these you can buy, you know, for $20 or so on DigiKey. Uh, and it's based on MEMS technology. So we have five of them, we have a battery pack, and then we have a real-time data analysis um, sitting on top. Again, this is relatively straightforward, a $20 microcontroller. And what it does, it essentially keeps, gets the data from these uh, three, uh, five accelerometers, uh, runs them through an infinite impulse response filter to uh, eliminate constant offsets, including gravity, and all essentially high frequency noise from vibrations uh, and so on, uh, before you start integrating the data, filtering uh, more, um, and try to essentially figure out, am I being displaced right now or not? And that's what it does. That's the motion detection subsystem. You would stick this into a timber indicating enclosure, and you're ready to go. Let me just show you some uh, quick data. So this is me uh, trying to push this thing. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you, relatively nice uh, you know, signal to noise ratio, uh, but maybe not impressive enough. I mean, this is a centimeter or so um, over a short period of time. Obviously, you would think, yes, you should be able to do that. What is nice here, you, you can actually turn it around and say, well, uh, obviously a nation state would have way more advanced capabilities than I have by pushing uh, this thing on my you know, uh, lab floor. Um, so what you can do is you just take a, a bunch of silent data when it was just sitting there and you zoom into the noise and then add synthetic offsets. You can say, what if I pushed it now with 10 micro G or 20 micro G, 30 micro G, which is where also Sandia and everyone seems to agree, if you get it down to that level, you cannot physically displace it you know, any meaningful distance over 24 hours. Uh, and you can see uh, that's what we've done here. You'd simply add an offset to your, to your quiet data uh, this is 30, 10, and 20, and you get the general idea, yes, we, we definitely get into that region, even with these basically, you know, very low-tech sensors that you can buy, you know, off DigiKey. Um, and uh, you can then, in a sense, calibrate your tag and say, well, if, you know, exceed a certain threshold, then it would um, indicate a, a, you know, a positive and uh, a violation of, of the agreement. So that's the, the basic idea of the buddy tag. Um, just to kind of wrap up the, the idea here, um, assuming, again, and this could be a, a denuclearization agreement, it could be another agreement where North Korea, or where we try to kind of constrain uh, the size of North Korea's program, and um, North Korea would declare a certain number of, of items. Um, North Korea would then receive one tag uh, for each of these items that, is, uh, that would be accountable under the framework. This could be anything, and you know, listed here. But the key is that at no time would North Korea be required to reveal the locations of all these items at the same time. Um, so we think uh, this is one of those three concepts that I listed at the beginning, satisfying this requirement that we recognize that North Korea has legitimate, I believe, security concerns. Um, my last slide. 
So, um, you know, if, as I said, I think there is still hope uh, for, um, you know, a path forward, a, a path for diplomacy. I do think that any, ver any viable verification approach must recognize North Korea's security concerns. Um, as I mentioned, I believe monitored storage or, you know, even geographical separation of, let's say, missiles, missile launchers and warheads would be a, a major accomplishment in terms of stabilizing uh, the situation uh, in the, on the Korean Peninsula would be a major a step toward denuclearization or toward a more traditional uh, kind of arms control type uh, framework. I also think that uh, going looking beyond North Korea, uh, that especially in um, verification approaches that take seriously or emphasize non-intrusiveness um, are, are an important part of the, the, the new world we're living in. I mean, we, we've seen an, an exciting time in the 1990s with um, lots of transparency, uh, bet especially between the US and, uh, and Russia. Uh, we're very, very far away from this uh, right now. I mean, I hope we'll, uh, you know, we'll get back to that point um, you know, at some point in the future, but I don't think it's going to happen overnight. Uh, China, for example, is also very reluctant in, in terms of being transparent about its weapons program. So I think there is really space and a role for technologies that acknowledge um, um, a certain reluctance to be uh, transparent from the outset. And, but I also think uh, there's, you know, plenty of uh, tools in our, in our toolbox that can help actually uh, chart a path forward here. So in that sense, I, I hope, and that's my final word here, uh, that North Korea may actually offer a, a kind of a really tangible use case for demonstrating new uh, verification technologies. I, uh, I want to acknowledge we'll, uh, briefly here the colleagues, former colleagues, so to speak, uh, from, from Sandia when we uh, worked on the buddy tag project until uh, 2017. You can see them uh, here, and I'm happy uh, to take questions. Thank you. Well, Scott again finished well before uh, the available time, so we have time for plenty of questions, if there are any. Please use the microphones, because we are recording this. Actually, we're recording all of the sessions sponsored by the Forum on Physics and Society, uh, both at this meeting and also at the April meeting. Please, with your question. Hi. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, how do you prevent uh, North Korea like switching in things? So the count still match, but it's not what you think it is. Yeah, that's, uh, it's a valid question. Uh, so the question is about how do you prevent uh, things being swapped out? Uh, we, we, we do not, and we do not want to capture it with this, uh, this technology. You know, you're you're uh, at liberty to over-declare your inventory. You can, we can track phony warheads down the road. Uh, that's, that's kind of fine. Uh, it, this would kind of rely on the idea that if you do get to an agreement that also envisions verified dismantlement, uh, then you would kind of catch this you know, down the road, but not with the, the simple body tag uh, scheme. And that's really by design. I mean, we, we essentially saying everything that looks like a warhead, will, and you tell us it's a warhead, we're going to track it. Uh, but if you, I see something else, and you know, what is this over there? Uh, this looks like a warhead to me too. Then you have to prove to me that this is actually not treaty accountable. Um, so there's some ambiguity in this concept, but I would say this is by design, and we think it makes it actually attractive. So for example, you can also take this idea you have, let's say you want to refurbish a weapon, or kind of perhaps even replace type A with type B. Uh, you know, it goes on, it goes into this room, uh, you disassemble your weapon, you make a new one, um, it counts one to one, it's the same body tag. Um, you know, you may or may not, this may not, well anyway, the, this would be permissible under this, this agreement. You count, you just count the numbers, uh, not the identity of the item itself. Now, let me ask a question. Uh, so have you discussed this with uh, North Korean scientists? Uh, obviously part of this process has to uh, involve uh, some discussion and, and, and see what they're willing to do, what they, maybe they have other ideas, uh, and if not, how do we get that process started? Well, uh, I don't have a good answer. No, we have not discussed this with North Korean um, you know, experts. As I said in the beginning, uh, the Hanoi summit just collapsed uh, recently. Um, it, we, everyone was expecting perhaps a shutdown of Yongbyon is really what's going to happen next. And, and this is where all the energy and all the focus will be for the next 
a uh, couple of years. We definitely have learned that North Korea is not willing, you know, Trump apparently proposed this grand bargain, you just give us everything. Uh, so I think there's now this, you know, we're now back to reality. North Korea will, and we always, I think many always assume this would be the case, for years to come, there will be nuclear weapons on North Korean territory. And the best we can, uh, we can accomplish really is trying to understand the, the size, perhaps agree, reach an agreement on the, on the on the, on the, you know, on, on the ceiling, and then start kind of um, tracking or at least having confidence that, that no, no more undeclared items exist in North Korea. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a preference for these three um, options. You know, right. there's hopefully 17. I don't really mind, you know, when the North Koreans tell us we don't like two, we like three, that's fine. But I think we, we'd like, we try to start a conversation here about, um, uh, you know, how to do it in a way that recognizes your interests. As far as I know, there are a small number of American uh, experts who have had uh, some experience with North Korea, in particular Siegfried Hacker, the former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory. Have you tried these out, ideas out on uh, Sig Hecker, and what does he think? You know, I made the slides on the way up to Boston, so to speak. I will send uh, them to okay. him uh, after, this, uh, after this uh, panel here. Okay, well, let's thank Alex Glazer. Oh, one, one more, more question. Like, Good. Yeah. So just, uh, we have plenty of time, so no, no shortage of time. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. Uh, and this is just a naive question because I don't work in this area at all, and I wonder how you could possibly uh, use the buddy tag system to uh, constrain uh, warhead. So, so specifically, I don't exactly understand what inspectors are allowed to do when they go to a facility. So it looked like in one of your slides, you had the green region where they could go and look at the buddy tags on the table, and then they had to look through a window to see the red region and count the number of suspected items. Right. But what if there's another room beyond the red region? Yeah, yeah. but that you always face that dilemma. Uh, you, you could, in principle, agree, uh, we do this first, uh, yeah. you know, in the morning, in the afternoon, we are allowed to look in other rooms that are big enough to, to hold treaty accountable items to make sure that nothing is in those rooms. And I believe that's kind of, that was done as part of the INF and, and so on. And There's always, you know, the declared versus the undeclared items. Undeclared is a totally different story, right. um, which you kind of have to treat separately. But everything that looks like a warhead and you tell me it's a warhead, I'm going to you know, count it one to one. If you have more things that look like treaty accountable, you have to convince me that they are not. But typically, how, like, do you get the floor plan in advance? Even if they say, we can't, you can't go in the red rooms, right? Do you really know like, how big the facility is that you are visiting? Well, I, you know, I mean, this is to be negotiated. Uh, you know, how much liberty the inspectors have to roam around and, and check uh, areas that have not been declared. OK, this is a really hard problem. And thank you for working on it. OK, okay. thanks. Okay. Another question. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these nuclear, like, non-proliferation treaties have sort of a bilateral element, right? Could you ever see this being used in the U.S.? Would the U.S. ever accept this, like, as a breach of their sovereignty, you know, to have these devices used in somewhere besides, like, the North Korean regime? Well, well the International Atomic Energy Agency does have <laughs> cooperation from the U.S. to some extent. Well, in many ways, this is way um, uh, fuzzier than uh, anything the IEA would accept, right? I mean, uh, the item has to be, uh, the tag has to be on the item, and, you know, the cameras are there. I mean, this gives you way more flexibility in moving things around and, and, and so on. So I think uh, the U.S., I mean, New Start, uh, in a sense, is way more intrusive in, in the way that, you know, inspectors actually look at, at you know, read serial numbers off uh, you know, of missile systems and, and so on. This is way less intrusive. Um, but as I mentioned, in the, especially with these mobile systems, um, it actually offers, you know, a lot of additional capabilities. Where, so you stop your mobile systems, your, your mobile launchers, and we'll be there in 24 hours. And, you know, these, these body tags would help you prove that they are not moving um, or, you know, being moved out of the way and so on. Yeah. Thanks. Let's thank Alex again.